You're watching Swipe, coming up on this week's show. Ripe for change, innovations in the wine world. Smart art, how synthetic DNA technology can scuffer forgeries. And it's all out war in our games review. Hello and welcome to Swipe. This week we're at an art framing studio. We're here to meet the British company fighting art forgery using synthetic DNA technology. More on that in a moment, but first, from fine art to fine wine, Chris has spent this week looking at how technology is changing one of the world's oldest industries. Well, that's the excuse he gave us anyway. Virtual reality isn't something you'd normally associate with wine. But this VR vineyard, complete with its own bird noises, aims to give a unique spin on blind tasting. As my wine is poured, on-screen hints give various flavour profiles. The idea is that you have to use what you've learnt to match the digital drinks up to the real thing. What do you think? So that one tastes quite citrusy. Mm -hmm. It's all a bit of fun, but how does it compare to being out on the country estates of France, Italy or Spain? It's not a matter of replacing going to a vineyard in a different country. It's more of um, trying to create a full experience on a wine tasting within well, where, where you are at that moment and with the means that you've got. There's a lot of other tech making its way into the wine industry. For those who prefer their wine decanted, this smart device aims to speed up the process. It draws in air from outside and pumps it into the wine, meaning an hour in traditional decanting time only takes a minute. It even links to your smartphone, working out the best duration based on the label and then sending you a notification when it's ready. I often hear the argument that you know, part of the joy of wine is, uh, is, is, is seeing it evolve during the course of an evening. If you are a wine connoisseur and you know how that wine is going to develop, then you know, fair enough, you can reserve that experience for yourself. However, um, most wine consumers, even consumers of fine wine, just want to enjoy a perfect glass of wine and that's what we're striving to deliver. There's clearly a demand for these kind of products. This smart wine bottle smashed its crowdfunding record earlier this year. It keeps the contents fresh for up to a month by stopping oxygen seeping in, and even has a touchscreen that suggests food pairings. But some say too much technology dilutes the wine drinking experience. I think technology in the wine industry is needed, but I do think that actually wine is quite a complicated subject. So the more technology that we have, Actually, in some cases, it makes it more complex for the consumer. You know, sometimes you just want wine to be wine. It's got to be simple. You've got to taste it. You've got to love it. I think sometimes these things cloud what's in the actual bottle itself. Wine is more popular now than ever, with 60% of UK adults saying it's their favourite alcoholic drink. All this gadgetry might not be to everyone's taste. Wine B has a herbaceous finish. But as the market grows, it's likely we'll see more ideas pouring in. Chris Cregan, Sky News. Stay with us. Still to come, I'll be getting a close-up look at some synthetic DNA technology being used to prevent art forgeries. But before then, here's a roundup of some of this week's other tech news. The US Navy is launching a new type of weapon, literally. These drones are fired into the air and attack in swarms, making them hard to target with standard anti-aircraft defences. The aptly named Locust Project is still in its test phase, but experts think it could be the future of warfare. Mount Everest's southern climbing route has been filmed in 360 for the first time. It means you can get a full view from the highest point on Earth without even being there. Swiss mountaineering equipment company Mammoth Sports Group are behind the project. They say the idea is to bring the concept of Google Street View to the most beautiful mountains on the planet. A gadget that it's claimed can turn any surface into a remote control has smashed its crowdfunding target, taking in more than half a million dollars in just a week. Noki attaches to walls, doors and furniture and then syncs up to your home devices so you can turn off your telly, switch off your alarm or set your coffee machine just by knocking. Stick around for our games review where we return to the world of Spira. Blitzball anyone? 
Now let's get back to why we're at this London Framing Studio. Come on over and meet Lawrence Merritt. He's the CEO of a company developing technology to prevent art forgery. Tell us about it. Sure. It's a unique tag that artists typically attach to the back of their work. Are we pretending this is the back of a painting? We're pretending that this is the back of a painting. Here's one that we prepared earlier. And why is this special? It has about 20 different security features on it, which makes it impossible to copy, fake or forge. What, what kind of security features are in there? Well, an example of one of the security features is a synthetic DNA that we've made in a lab in Cambridge. What's a synthetic DNA? It's a man-made DNA. It's not a human. It's nobody's <laughs> DNA. It's, it's, a, it's a nobody's DNA. It's a man-made <laughs> DNA. It's ha it has about half a billion particles, and only we have the key to the code of that DNA. How easy is it to get these on the back of paintings? It's really simple. We have an applicator and a stamp. So every artist has their own stamp, their own applicator. It takes about five seconds to apply. They put this onto the back of their work, wherever they want to stamp it. They press this down, the unique pattern on that against the unique pattern of the stencil creates a unique mark there. They then peel this back to reveal the paper label housing the DNA. They flap this down and the work is tagged. Now here on Swipe, whenever we look at new technology, we like to get the view of other industry experts. So I'm going to call in James Ratcliffe from the Art Loss Register. He's been listening patiently from behind our cameraman, Andy. Sure. James, thanks for joining us. Now, you're an expert in dealing with stolen artwork and forged artwork. What do you think of this tag smart technology? I think it's a fantastic opportunity for living contemporary artists to protect their work. Um, it's a very difficult area for the art market to face the question of authenticity and anything that can be produced that helps to demonstrate to buyers that what they are acquiring is the real thing, is a good thing. Yeah, well, what is the current industry standard way of authenticating artwork? Unfortunately, there is no standard. It's typically the artist signing the work. A signature? A, a signature. Yeah. Which I could just fake, or which, anyone could just fake. Which anybody could just fake, yes. Anything you don't like about this? Um, the question mark with all of these systems is the question of how easy it is to actually check the mark or the tag against some kind of database. And as soon as people hear synthetic DNA, they're going to panic. But from everything that Lawrence has said, it sounds like it's a relatively straightforward system. So it, that will help it in the, in the market. Time for a different art form now. Here's Luke with this week's games review. Total War Warhammer brings together two long-standing British institutions. The first is Games Workshop's Warhammer series of miniature figures, and the second is Creative Assembly's Total War series of games. Previously, the Total War games have been strategy games that have focused on history, so whether it's the Shogun era of Japan, or Rome, or the medieval era, um, this is the first one to actually leave history behind and go into the realms of fantasy, and it's made people ask, why on earth this has never happened before. There's two parts of the game. The first is an overall map where you basically take control of an army and get to move them around and try and build up settlements. And the second is where you face off against your foes on the battlefield itself. Bringing together the two different series is inspired. Before, some of the older games suffered from too many of the different factions feeling the same. But now, when you take control of the humans, you have either griffin riders and mages. If you're the dwarves, you get to take control of big, big artillery and mechanical creations. If you opt to go as the orc greenskins, then you constantly have to keep attacking, because if you fail to do so, they start to infight and your army collapses in itself like a dying star. And if you choose to be the vampires, then you need to plan quite far ahead, because they need to spread corruption wherever they go, lest they burn to dust in the light of the sun. It's a very, very new take on the game, and hopefully a taste of things to come. Conquer this world. Fire Emblem Fates is the latest instalment in a series that's been going for 26 years. It comes in two different varieties. Fire Emblem Conquest is for series veterans who've played a bit before, and Fire Emblem Birthright is for newcomers to the franchise. It's basically a tactical RPG. So what you're doing is you're selecting your characters from a range of classes, and you're building a team, moving them around, and basically trying to complete the campaign. But another side of the game is the relationships between the characters. You have a hub called My Castle, which you can decorate as you please, um, and build lots of different buildings, and focus on really building the relationships between the members of your squad. The reason you want to do this is because if they're of the opposite gender, a romance can blossom between them, and they can actually have offspring that inherit the best abilities of both parents. If you haven't tried Fire Emblem yet, 
this is the game to get involved with, especially the Birthright Edition. It's got the best graphics, the best writing, and the story is incredibly enjoyable. I make my own feet. Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X-2 were originally released back on the PS2 way back at the turn of the millennium. But now they've been re-released in HD and this week they are coming to PC, specifically Steam. If you haven't played the game, although Final Fantasy has fallen on hard times in recent years, these are from the golden age of Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy X is one of the first truly 3D games in the series, still has the turn-based battles, still has the random battles and still has airship exploration. It's an incredibly deep and interesting game, and the storyline, although some of the dialogue has aged quite poorly, is still very enjoyable. Ten Two isn't quite as good, it's more light-hearted and set just slightly after the events of the first game. However, it is still quite unique, and the real-time battles in this marked a turning point for the series, and so it's definitely worth giving it a shot. But the real reason you want to get involved in these games is because of the world that it spawned. The world of Spirit is unparalleled by any other world in any other Final Fantasy game. Whether it's the religious zealots that are trying to tell you that everything bad that's happening is your fault, or the tropical beachside huts that the peasantry live in. It's incredibly varied, incredibly beautiful, and a world that if you haven't explored yet, you really need to. Well, that's it for this week. Take a look at Sky News on mobile, tablet, catch up, SkyQ and Snapchat for all the latest tech stories throughout the week. And I'll see you again next time. Bye bye.